Chris and Chris Talk Movies. Hello, and welcome back to the podcast. My name is Chris Ferry, and this is my co-host. My name is Chris Huddleston. And today we're both very excited to be talking to you about a cuckoo bird's crazy film, Miracle Mile. Love can sure spin your head around. God, where do you begin? Well, hello. We must have been meant to be together. It's too bad you have to work tonight. Only till midnight. Fate is a funny thing. Take a nap, because you're going to need all your energy tonight. <laughs> It was one of those strange nights. <gasps> Finally meet the right girl and you blow it. That could ruin your whole day. In a big way. Dad, it's happening. This is it. This is really it. This is the big one. This is a joke, right? It's really happening. 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 This can't be true. We'll all be dead if we don't get out of here. Nobody believes this, do they? Not me, not Spongy. Make a list for me. People who we want to bring along. We gotta get Julie. Who's Julie? Uh, Harry Belafonte. Who are you? Who are you? Stop and let me off. I don't stop for nothing. Jump! <laughs> don't hurt me, man. I got Nakamichi Pioneer. I got everything. If it doesn't happen, I'll tell you. If what doesn't happen, man? I'm dreaming. That's, that's it, I'm dreaming. Y'all ready to go? You the pilot? Hey! Hey, do you know anybody who can fly a helicopter? Helicopter pilot. All the helicopter pilot bars are closed. What's the problem? It's true. Love can be exciting. Trust me with this. Even terrifying. Julie! Give me help! I love you! But nothing could prepare you for an experience like this. What is it, you heard? Miracle Mile. Listen, I'm just a guy who can pick up the phone. Do you have a synopsis for us, Mr. Huddleston? I do. So this was a film released in 1988. It was directed by Steve de Jarnet. I don't I'm probably butchered. I probably butchered that. It stars Anthony Edwards, Mayor Winningham, McKelty Williamson, some other people. And the synopsis is as such. Musician Harry Washello, Anthony Edwards, Edwards, sits down at a Los Angeles diner where he instantly takes an interest in waitress Julie Peters, Mayor Winningham. The feeling is mutual, so the pair arrange a date for later that day. But things go awry when Harry picks up a random phone call from a frantic soldier who warns of a nuclear attack that will hit L.A. within the hour. Scrambling, Harry finds Julie and the two do everything that they can to escape to safety. Yep. So this was a first time watch for for both of us. So what did what did you think about this, Christopher? Well, not I mean this movie was 88 89 88 88. Um so a long time passing, but we do spoil these films and this is one of those movies that I I'm glad I didn't know what was going to happen when I watched it. So if you have any interest in watching this, and this is kind of a beloved film. I, if you Google it and read reviews, people are kind of go bonkers about it. So seriously, if you don't want to know what happens in this movie, go check it out. And I encourage you to do that. Um, but starting now, we're going to spoil it. So this movie is crazy. Um, there's a lot that I really loved about it. Uh, the limits test I always apply to films is, did I enjoy it? Like if we're going to recommend thumbs up, thumbs down, would you sit down with a bowl of popcorn and someone you like and watch this together? To me, that it really depends on who you're sitting down to watch mm -hmm. it. I don't think it's a great date movie. It's not a movie I would watch with my parents. It's a kind of an art film within the Hollywood system from 1988. Um, it's definitely a labor of love and it doesn't have a happy ending. That's the spoiler. So it becomes this kind of existential commentary on the nuclear crisis and our self-destructive natures. Like I, I don't, 
have an art school thesis ready to go on this film, but it it's a script. I mean, you just don't see this movie made for fairly obvious reasons. It's a downer. <laughs> Ultimately, it's a real downer. Um, and by the end of it, it's really upsetting and scary. I mean, I, you know, by the time push comes to shove in the final quarter of this movie, uh, you know, I, I'm trying to think of too many other things that I've seen that were as effective in terms of conveying, you know, real human chaos and the despair and the fear that would come along with that. And it's not that this is a crazy big budget movie. It's not. It's far from it. But the things it chooses to show you and the way that it unfolds itself um, is super effective in that regard. What did you think? Yeah, so uh, 1988 would have been peak movie watching time for me. So I love finding a film like this that I've not seen before and didn't know very much about. I, I was not aware of this movie at all until a couple of years ago, I started hearing just kind of rumblings of it here and there on, on other podcasts that I listened to. And then I saw a trailer just recently and, you know, saw a lot about how this is one of the most underrated movies of the eighties. And I, I would say, you know, I would, I would have to agree with that. This is definitely, cause this is a movie that, like you said, the people who love it, love it, but it's not, it's just not talked about that much. Um, and, you know, we, um, so we grew up in the era when we were scared all the time that there was going to be a nuclear attack, you know, and that was kind of pounded into us by the media. And, and, you know, uh, there was famously a, uh, actually TV miniseries called the day after. Oh my God. And, you know, we were like in elementary school when that came it out and I'm, it was on primetime. I think it was on like I, NBC. I know. And I watched that. It was on at like eight o'clock at night and I watched it and episode one scarred me for life. Yeah. And we were, I don't know, 10 or 11 or something like that watching it. Yeah. And so, so one thing that I wonder is younger people watching this today that didn't grow up with that. You know, we had a little tiny taste recently with Russia and the Ukraine where it was like, oh, maybe you know, Russia was going to use nuclear weapons, but you know, younger people have, have grown up with all kinds of other fears that we didn't have, but I just wonder how effective this would be somebody growing up that didn't have that fear of nuclear attack. I mean, other than just, it's the end of the world. And you yeah. know, that's a, that's a pretty, um, oh, you know, universal fear. There are a lot of similarities, right. And this film really, really, gets its finger on 80s Cold War nuclear um, catastrophe. Excuse me. Um, I think what we're experiencing with climate change right now is similar in terms of the fact that it is this staring down the barrel of an absolutely senseless and needless end of human life on Earth. Right. Preventable, completely preventable, and yet seemingly inevitable like every year that goes by that we don't do anything now i would say that there is actually a fair amount of progress being made on the climate front but good news is woefully underreported uh versus bad news and bad projections i'm not minimizing the crisis by any no. stretch of the imagination but i but there's a sort of a despair you can sense now I think particularly a young among younger people, we as human beings favor negative outcomes. We we give negative outcomes. We focus more on negative outcomes. We are more loss averse than we are gain motivated. I didn't know how I said that. Well, you're mm -hmm. the psychology guy, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I, so I think that the obsession right now is this doesn't need to be happening and it affects everybody. Why aren't we doing anything? And I, that's similar to the feeling in the eighties of like, well, we all have these missiles and we all know that it will end life on earth. Why do we continue to saber rattle in this way? Why do we continue to threaten each other to use them? Nobody wins that game. 
right? Mm-hmm. Uh, but it was terrifying because I think the pre- the prevalent thing was like, oh, it's gonna, oh, oh, they're escal, it's escalating any day now, you know? Yeah. Uh, and I think the vibe. I think that young people today, it's it's similar. I don't know, maybe not. Yeah, I don't know, but but yeah, the, in terms of just the world ending, it's it definitely would be similar. Now this is you know, this is obviously different because it's the world ending almost in an instant instead of the world ending over time, you know? Um, and so I don't, I don't know where I'm going with that, but, uh, so with this film, um, there's some other things about it that are, that are definitely kind of unlike movies today. One thing that, um, that they seem to have kind of gotten away with, with films. I don't know why, but but this movie almost entirely takes place in downtown LA. Yeah. Which it just seemed a lot of those movies from our youth is just like, I don't know if it's just because it was cheap or what, but it, they just shot it in downtown LA, you know? Um, <clears throat> so you have all of that. It uh it's a little silly in the beginning. You know, it's it's definitely lighter, starts off lighter, and it has this movie logic of, you know, people meet and fall in love in one day, you know. Um and Mayor Winningham, not I mean, not to be uh, you know, mean or whatever, but her hairdo in this is awful. I mean, it's just terrible. Um, I it's mean, I guess strange, it was this it's a strange kind of mullet, isn't it? I mean, yeah, it I'm just trying it's to like grasp it. I'm like, was it um the arrhythmics? What what are what are the what's the influence here? It's bright yeah. red mullet or eurythmics or you know it's like ziggy stardust david bowie yes. you know yes it's 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 not a flattering hairdo by any not. by any means um but so you know all of that with them sort of falling for each other is you know is kind of fun and then you have um and for as big of uh star as he was in the at the time i should know but mckelty williamson who was bubba bubba gump is in this and i mean he's fantastic and some of the so again we're going to spoil this but um he gets hooked up with with anthony edwards and he, he ultimately winds up things just start to devolve for for everybody um and he gets killed by the the police and and that that may have been I mean, there's it's upsetting, obviously, in the end, but that was as upsetting to me as anything when yeah. when he dies. Yeah. Um. So it's like it's a it's a romance, right? It's an L.A. romance. Everything. There's a lot of blue in this movie. He's got this bright blue coat, and you just see blue and blue and blue. Everything's bright blue, like blue skies. And he's a trombonist, and there's a sort of um throwback like for the 80s like he's into he plays in the sort of like jazz band big big band thing um and but they don't present it as like cool it's just like there's only old people you know, watching kind of you dorky know. and just yeah. kind of like enamored of a previous time but it's sweet and apparently these these two leads went to school together and you know i think their 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 ease with each other in the film is terrific we don't get a lot of we establish pretty quickly that they meet and it's kind of this quirky love at first sight. And and then he he's at this, you know, something kind of. Goofus happens, he's going to meet up with her later. She works at an all night diner. He's going to meet up with her later at the end of her shift, which is, you know, in the middle of early morning, like two in the morning or something. Mm hmm. And uh, he has a gig the following day, so he's going to catch some sleep in the afternoon when they part. And he goes to smoke a cigarette and only takes about a puff of it and then flicks it away. And that moment stuck with me. I'm like, who? why are movies full of people like tapping out a cigarette, lighting it, taking one drag and then <laughs> yeah. uh, and throwing away a lit cigarette? Have you ever <laughs> seen anybody do that time? before? <laughs> yeah. And we, we just did Buster Scruggs not too long ago. And the guy shoots him in the back, sits down, takes out his rolling papers, taps some tobacco in it, puts away the tobacco pouch, rolls himself a cigarette, you know, cleans it up, puts it in his mouth, strikes a match on his boot, takes one hit, 
puts it out, puts it in his pocket for later, and then goes on with the scene. I'm like, we just spent like a minute with this guy rolling a cigarette. He decides not to smoke. There's no reason why he doesn't. Nothing crosses his face. But you see this a lot. People are like, they take one drag. All right, let's get out of here. <laughs> yeah. Wasting cigarettes. Yeah. Anyway, so and this guy throws a full lit cigarette. In a desert. <laughs> in LA, right? Yeah. And, you know, and a pigeon picks it up and takes it back to its nest <laughs> and, and it burns the nest down. So a little foreshadowing right there. And the fire burns out, you know, the some power cables that it's, I guess the pigeon has built its nest on power cables of the building or something. It's not, don't think about it too hard. Power mm. goes out in the building. His alarm doesn't go off. So he's late and he goes running down to the diner and it is the wee wee hours of the morning and she's already gone and he's upset because they're just started dating and they're pretty excited about each other. And out of left field, the payphone rings. He calls and leaves her a message on the payphone like, hey, I'm really sorry. You know, the uh, it, craziest thing happened. The power went out. My alarm didn't go off. Um, And he hangs up and he steps away from the phone booth to try and decide what to do next. And the, the phone booth rings. So, I mean, maybe it's her calling the number. Right. Back. You don't know. He goes over and he answers it. And, and this is what kicks off the whole body of the film is he gets it's this sort of panicked phone call of a guy who says he's a soldier and works we discover he's a soldier and works in a missile silo and he's trying to call his dad but he has he has dialed in his you know frantic state has dialed the wrong area code and gotten this pay phone instead but he doesn't figure that out the speaker doesn't figure that out until anthony edwards can get a word in edgewise and he recognizes it's not his dad on the other line but he says we're going to launch our missiles in 50 minutes and we're going to get Russia's are going to get back to us in an hour or 10 or something like that. Um, And then he's like, Oh, they see me on the monitor. And then you hear gunshots. And then another voice comes on and says, you know, forget everything you just heard and go to sleep, go back to sleep. So that really shakes him up and he goes into the diner and, and tries to warn everybody in the diner and they don't, believe him to various degrees but there's a woman in the diner who has some government connect connections and has like a satellite phone in her briefcase she's flipping through a, the cliff's notes of gravity's rainbow right which is about a nazi super weapon or basically a nukes mm -hmm. um and she sort of you know she says wait tell me everything he said and there's some you know code in there that she recognizes and she goes, oh, that could be legit. So then they, they scramble this plan to like, all right, we need to get to the airport or we need to get to the building where we need to get to this building where a helicopter can pick us up and airlift us to the airport so we can get to the Antarctic or something. She's got a plan. And it all feels crazy. And, you know. Mm -hmm. but But suddenly it's this crazy race. He wants to find... He wants to find his new girlfriend, right? He can't get to the airport without her. Well, nobody wants to stop. You know, you can't divert from the plan. So he jumps out of the back of the thing. And that's where he meets these other characters, right? And it's things just keep going left. And it's like that phone call is like a billiards break that sends all of the balls ricocheting around the table in various directions. And it's kind of a brilliant structure when you think about it. You know, as the viewer, I felt like I, like Anthony Edwards, I felt like I was just hanging on by one hand. Mm -hmm. And it's also a very L.A. film in that strange, surreal stuff happens. Like, you, they find themselves in these settings. So we, we have some serious drama with this uh, character. He kind of carjacks a guy who's a, a radio thief. And then they, they go to get gas and the cops show up. It all just goes South. And, and that was crazy. That's I know the other guy. So he just to get away from the cops, cause he has warrants out for him. This is the guy he carjacks. Um, he sprays gas on the cops and then the cops fire their guns and it sets off the gas and the whole gas station blows up mushroom cloud, more foreshadowing, right? We keep seeing that mushroom cloud shape over and over again too. Mm -hmm. And 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 he gets in the cop car. They I guess they steal the cop car and then they go to her apartment block and he says, Don't leave, wait here for me. Well, the guy leaves. Um, 
But we, he comes back later and crashes his car into this department store. He went to get his sister. So it's like everybody he tells goes ricocheting off on there. They've got to go find their loved one and hatch some plan of escape of their own, right? Mm -hmm. And that scene where he comes careening back in and he's got his sister, but they've been shot by the cops and she dies in his arms and he tries to go up the down escalator right before he himself dies. Oh my God. It is absolutely heartrending. And then the cops are outside being like, you know, come out with your hands up and they're having this panic. He found his girlfriend by this time. They they have this panic conversation. Uh, you just can't, without synopsizing the whole thing, blow by blow, you just can't. It really is like billiard balls just ricocheting around the table. And we just follow this one guy, this kind of white ball that 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 uh, started the, th the whole thing off. And, and characters will ricochet back into focus like we... We have this crazy thing with the guy he carjacks and then we lose him. And then, but he comes ricocheting back in and he's got a sister and they die. And there's a guy that's trying to coordinate the supplies on the helicopter that's ranting and raving at first. And we come back up to the rooftop and you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That health club scene is oh. absolutely bonkers. And this he goes in the health club trying to find a pilot and he's just going, he has a gun and he just goes up to everybody, you know, anybody who's a pilot, you know, by anybody can fly a helicopter, you know. Right. And he, but he finds somebody and he's like, well, uh, we gotta, we gotta bring my boyfriend and he's a gay guy. And he says, yeah, mm -hmm. is there a problem? And Anthony Edwards is like, no. And I thought in 1988, we've got a trans character in the diner that is not made a joke of. It's, no. just, uh, it's just an LA reg, just one of the late night regulars at this bar having a conversation with, uh, What's his name? Um, he was he's in everything. The guy we love. And then I can't remember his name. <laughs> uh, he yeah, watched, I can't... Uh, Nightmare Alley. And he was the bad guy in that. And he was in Shape of Water. And anyway. I just thought, well, this is really ahead of its time in that regard. If you saw gay characters in the 80s, they were these kind of jokes. You mm -hmm. know, it was like somebody doing a mincing accent and a, uh, and a limp wrist and that it was just this token buffoon character. Um, yeah. And the guy that's the, who's the, uh, the pilot, he was like this buff, like workout guy. And I think he says like, he's ex military. And then, yeah, he's like, I got to go get somebody. And it's this other, you know, this, this other guy. And yeah, that was, and again, that guy wasn't, wasn't they, like he was played off, for last. They or don't anything. leave. They do fly off, but they come back at right. the end. And you think, oh, wow. You think maybe this is it. Maybe they are going to get out by the skin of their teeth. Mm -hmm. They don't. You know, so there, it, it follows the shape of a Hollywood movie in that you think all is lost. And then here comes the cavalry right at the end. But they don't get away. Right. So yeah. the, the underlying message is you don't escape a nuclear holocaust right like you oh the scene where the guy on the roof where he's caught in the blast and he puts his hands up and his eyeballs melt through his fingers mm -hmm. that is insane that yeah. is insane that shot did you um so you really feel like up until the last few minutes at least i did that it could go either way in terms of is this really going to happen or is it just a widespread panic? Right. Um, and you don't really know until the last few minutes. And it's, and I kept thinking this is very much one of these movies where you're, you're thinking, okay, if I were in this situation, you know, what would I do? Right. Would I, right. would I behave like this guy? The whole movie. You're like, what would I do in this situation? What would I do? And you're but you're thinking towards the end, at least I was thinking if, you know, it's like, okay, you have two really bad scenarios. The it's really going to happen and everybody's going to die, which is obviously the worst possible case. Or 
it doesn't happen and he's ruined a bunch of people's lives you know basically by them interacting with him you know right um there's a point at which he he's like looks at the clock because the whole thing is a countdown right mm -hmm. from the, there's clocks all over this aren't they at some point whether maybe it's the department store they're in like a clock shop and they're just in the department store yeah covered by the, um but right you have this turning all, turning clock at the diner he it, it, he gets the phone call when he gets it's like we're gonna fire in 50 minutes we'll get him back in in, in an hour 10 or something like that um he turns and marks the time and that's a very clear shot in the film so we we are from that point on we're on a countdown and rather than have like uh you know in some movies you have the the ticker the clock superimposed mm -hmm. in different scenes we don't get that but we do keep seeing clocks we keep seeing clocks and it's up to us to track it if we want to but at the point where it's been an hour since he got the call, he is like, did I, like people by this point have died. <laughs> yeah. I was this just a crank call, like some people said, or a crazy and all of this is my fault. Like all of this blood, is it on my hands? Because I was, you know, chicken little. But we pretty soon after that discover that that is. That is not the case. And we see right. a news we we see a news reporter on TV get shot by it's just chaos in the streets. It's mm -hmm. just absolute chaos. And that's when I think the movie gets really scary. Um, there's people crawling under cars and everybody's just running for their life and looting and killing each other. And yeah, uh, wow. It is again, it's not super high budget. And I've seen you've seen things like World War Z. And stuff where there's panic shots, crowd panic in cities. But I think this is among the most effective of anything I've seen. Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, early on, you know, there's a good bit of 80s cheese in this. Yep. But yeah, once, once you know, stuff starts going badly, it's very effective and disturbing and upsetting. You know, this is definitely, we said the same thing or I said the same thing last last week when we watched uh, The Girl with All the Gifts. This is, you know, we're recording this um, the week before Christmas. And man, like if you're having the holiday blues or anything, you know, or seasonal blues, this is probably not a movie you want to watch right now. You know, watch it, watch it when you're not feeling uh, sad because, I mean, this, it it's definitely a real downer by the end, you know, and you have this, so we have this setup with in the beginning when they meet he there's a voiceover with him and i don't know there's if there's voiceover throughout the entire film or or not but there's voiceover in the beginning okay. and he's talking about how he's 30 years old and he's never right. met you know the right woman and everything and you know finally he's met her and you think again, you know, how just for this guy and, and you know, for this woman, how tragic it is that they meet and they know each other for about a day and then the world ends. Yeah, it kind of underlines the senselessness of the whole man-made Armageddon. Um, I think so. So he finds her and they're going back up to the rooftop to see if they if the helicopter is still there that's the only plan they've got the streets are impassable the streets are human chaos it's a meat grinder in the streets so they sort of find themselves at near the base of this helicopter building again and they they head up and they're in the elevator which is where uh it's pictured behind me and there there's just a long scene where they're sort of dealing with it and working their way through it. And, uh, you know, as kind of cheesy and eighties and romantic comedy as the first quarter or 20% of this film is, this is just straight drama and it's really yeah. affecting. Um, it, it's really sad and scary as these two try and, you know, come to terms and he's trying to calm her down. He's like, we won't feel anything. And then, so they're going up the elevator and at one point a nuke goes off and it gets real bright. You see the light kind of in the whole building shutters. It's obviously, it's not close enough to destroy the building, 
but you know they're like was that yeah yeah that's what that was what do you think that was what what else and it's really terrifying they get up to the top in this formerly blue sky this sunny miracle mile la perfect blue sky now the chroma has changed to red and it, there's just this sort of dust and particulate in the air and a red haze and the other guy is there on the roof his shirt's off and he's yelling and screaming um and uh i forget exactly the sequence the helicopter is gone and they are sort of like you know it's over there's no we're going to die up here on the roof and then the helicopter comes back and they scramble in the guy can't came back for them and they scramble in it and he takes off they give you that you know that you're gonna have the holiday hollywood ending gonna get away there it's like oh they're gonna get away you know yeah. the guy came back at the last minute you know. ride away on the horse um and as they're as they're flying away looking down at the chaos another nuke closer goes off and it doesn't incinerate again not close enough to just incinerate them but enough to knock the helicopter out of the sky and it crashes in the Labre tar pits, which is one of the places they were sort of hanging out and having a meet cute at the beginning of the film. And they sink into the Labre tar pits in the helicopter and the end of the movie, we don't, it spares us them drowning in tar, but basically it's like that scene from uh, Blade Runner 2049 where the, he's in the car and it's sinking and they can't it get out. It was a lot like that. Yeah. And, you know, and you're just watching the water level rise as they're, you know, she's panicking, trying to get out and go up to the surface. And he's like, there's, n there's nothing up there. There's nothing up there. Like you can't, you can't go up to the surface. Yeah. The surface is worse. Like oddly, we're as protected as we're going to get in this sinking helicopter under a lake of tar. It, it, it the movie ends with them with them sort of just cuts to black. yeah it, it, and you think they say they're going to turn to diamonds right exactly like the dinosaurs like the mammoths or whatever that were and they so the very the opening shot in, of the, the future, film they'll find our bones right they'll excavate us the opening shot of the film is uh so they're at the the tar pits and there's a museum there and the opening shot is a video about the big bang and evolution and how, you know, we came up out of the sea and evolved to, to, uh, you know, eventually evolved to, uh, mammals. And so now, you know, it's basically like we've come full circle that, you know, humanity is now going to end. And, you know, I, th I thought that was a, a neat, a neat way that they wrapped that up. It's like we started in the tar pits, we end in the tar pits. Um, and it's what, like what humanity I, had its run for however many millions yeah. of years. And that just feels really strange in 1988 for me to see a film that, you know, it's not alone in cinema history for being a film that so, I mean, mad God kind of makes me feel like that. Like, mm -hmm we live in a hell of our own creation, right? And in some ways we're doomed to repeat it. Like we can't, it's cold comfort, but it's like we're human beings, it's hardwired or the Terminator, right? You, it's in your nature to destroy yourselves. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that's a theme that you see again and again, but, but sticking with Terminator for a minute, there's a happy ending in it. Right. So, oh, we did this horrible thing at Skynet. I mean, not if you spool out to the whole Terminator franchise, but yeah. each film gives you this kind of lets you off the hook and being like, oh, well, they squeaked through. We, we, you know, we managed to just make it out just in time. A lot, not a lot of people didn't, but our heroes did. Um, and to see a movie like this is like, nope. <laughs> you know, it's not yeah. the happy ending in a thermonuclear war. And what's what else is interesting to me is there's no, it doesn't, you don't, it's senseless. Like, we don't know about the geopolitics. It's not a game of chess. We don't know anything about what caused it. It's just this stupid, senseless. You never see the president and like right. Gorbachev exactly. or whoever it would have been at the time. You know. fell, right. And we don't know. We're just two little people. <clears throat> yeah. 
that get crushed under it. Um, yeah, but for 88, you know, I'm, I'm thinking uh, it just. I guess, I mean, we had the day after and stuff like that, but so there were nuclear apocalyptic movies. It's certainly this was certainly a theme of the 80s. But one that that starts off like a Hollywood movie and ends with such a heartrending and tragic and senseless where our two lovers <laughs> don't make it out i was just like wow wow there there is a so i watched i don't know what you watched this on i watched it on tubi with with ads and the next film that came up which i didn't watch but the next film came that came up to watch is i think it's called threads and it's a uh, a British film that, um, from what I understand, and you know, if we any UK listeners that we have that are familiar with this, you could correct me on this, but uh, I think it's kind of like their day after. It's kind of the I think it was on like the BBC, and it was the I think it was early '80s, and it's you know their film that traumatized traumatized kids, but. Um, so that's one that I would like to check out uh, sometime. But, you know, this is a genre without a lot of films. And I think part of the reason is this. Uh, I looked up the, the box office for this show. It made like three hundred fifteen thousand dollars. So um, I mean, like I say, you, it's, an, it's an art film dressed up as a Hollywood film. Yeah. I think the budget was under four million dollars. And um, but, you know, along this lo these lines kind of a you know the films that are in this small subgenre so we had um don't look up just was that last year or 2020 i don't know time is all messed up now uh it wasn't earlier than 2020 i don't think and there's another film called um finding a friend for the end of the world have you ever have you ever seen that mm -hmm. I haven't seen it, but it, I, it has I, Steve Carell and Kira Knightley and it's different because it's the, I think like the sun is going to explode and, uh, or something like that, or like solar flares are going to destroy the earth. And it's, um, it's kind of like, don't look up where there's a time frame like six months or something like that, that people, you know, have to prepare for it. Um, but that's, it's more of a comedy, but that's uh, I saw it in the movie theater and haven't seen it since, but but really loved it um, at the time. But it, it has kind of, you know, a similar feel as this. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, th this one is heavy for sure. There I mean, must be a lot of people that know a lot more about film and the backstory of how this got made and um that would have interesting insights into it it would be interesting to watch this movie with those people and get the skinny because um you get the sense that there's a lot of personal uh, passion that went into it and, i saw a tweet from the director and i i didn't uh i didn't look into it further i should have but that he said that basically he went broke making this movie so he must have you know, must have been a lot of his own money put into it and it, you know, and it, it didn't do all that well, but it, I mean, it definitely, uh, I think maybe I said this at the beginning, but I love finding movies yeah. like this from our youth that I've never seen or don't know much about. Um, these just kind of yeah. little hidden gems. Would you recommend it? Oh, sure. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, again, with caveats, you know, it's not, this is definitely not a movie for everybody. Right. Um, I think the entertainment value of it is if you're a cinephile, it's remarkable. You know what I yeah. mean? I think if you're just casually flipping around and you landed on this, I think you'd feel betrayed somehow. Like, what the hell was that? You know, mm -hmm. not that it's bad, but it doesn't, you know, scene to scene and line to line. And it, it feels like a small movie. It feels like a movie that you had to scramble to make that 
you didn't have the luxury of going and getting different versions of something or going back and getting a lot of reshoots or some things that you couldn't fix in editing quite the way that you had wanted it to come out, you know? Um, and so I think that makes it a little bit challenging to watch if you're looking for an entertainment, you know, that and the ending. <laughs> yeah. But, but I think if you're into cinema, I mean, I I had not heard of this and is one of those ones having seen it. Then I'm like, how have I not heard of this movie? You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, How have I not heard of this movie? It's really something. Uh, I was talking with my brother-in-law about this and he actually, uh, he was kind of excited that we were going to do this because I said something about it to him. And this was kind of, so he's six years younger than me. Um, but this was kind of like, so he was too young to have seen uh, the day after, but he said he saw this on HBO and he was like 11. And he said like, it scarred him for life. And so he was, he was asking me about some different scenes and things. And, uh, uh, and like I, sh I showed him the trailer and he was like, you know, cause the trailer makes it, yeah. it's still, you know, they don't hide the fact about what it's about, right, but it makes it. it. What's that? Spoil it in the trailer. Yeah. They don't, they don't show you the dire end, but they show them on top of the car when the world's coming apart, you know? Right. But they also make it seem more fun than what it is, you know? Uh, lighter than what it is. So no, I showed him the trailer and I was having a bad day. Yeah. So <laughs> like I showed him the trailer. Day. I showed him the trailer and it, it was like, well, maybe it's one of these things where, you know, it was really intense because I was a little kid and now I would watch it and it would. And I said, so I watched it and I said, no, it's still really intense, you know, watching it now, <laughs> decades later yeah. as an adult, you know? Yeah. I mean, it didn't, it didn't give me nightmares. Uh, no that kind of intense but I, and it's I not over i was like wow it's not the most you know like this is the most disturbing film that i've ever seen but it's upsetting and it's emotional in the end you know yeah, yeah. and i think also be, being children well you know older children uh in the 80s in 88 we were in high school but yeah uh, so we would have been like 16 when this came out but uh you know, living through the 80s. That's why we go back and do so many of these 80s movies is they're kind of seminal parts of, you know, and with with all of these, you know, changes in social, whatever, the people are like, oh, it was a different time. And you're like, that doesn't let you off the hook. And it doesn't. But we are, um, you know, we are products of our society. And you know, watching some of these movies, some of them stand up in in great fun ways and other ones really do not age well. And you go, oh, wow, that I, I actually remember that that I didn't bat an eye at that when mm -hmm. I was 15 and saw that. I just was accepted that, oh, that's how it is, because that's what popular culture is reflecting to me. Um, You know, so I think that. uh I think that part of the charm of this for me is that it is it is so it is so much a movie of 1988 but then there are these kind of very ahead of its time feeling scenes. Yeah. And they mostly happen near the end of the movie where people are really reckoning with their death and the performances are um timeless. I mean they're just they're just wonderful. You're right that death scene I mean, it's great, powerful stuff. And it almost yeah. feels like different a different movie, right? The first yeah, half it does a little bit, yeah. Like a different movie than the second half of the movie. Um, except it's not. And it's it pretty seamlessly flows from one to the other. And these kind of it doesn't flow. It kind of like a ricocheting billiard ball, it kind of zigs and zags around. Mm-hmm. But um, he did this. Uh, Anthony Edwards did this after Top Gun. Yeah, he already had Top Gun when he did this. You know. Yeah, yeah. I don't know how much the thing about with him. I don't know how much leading man stuff he did. Not too. You much. know, on ER though, he was a principal on ER. Yeah, that's true. I know his TV, but 
But so you would, I would say you would recommend this as well, right? I, I do. And the only caveat that I would put on it is it's like, just be warned. I don't think of this as a popcorn movie. I think of it as, um, uh, oh, you're really into movies and you've never seen this. You got to check this movie out. It's, it's just crazy, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Crazy out. Just watch it and then we'll talk about it. That kind of thing, you know? So, I mean, if you've heard us talk about this, if you think it's exciting and even though we spoiled it for you, then yeah, you got to see this. Um, and it's a bit hard to find as a, to define in a genre, you know, is it a horror movie? Is it a science fiction movie? Is it a romance? Is it a drama? You know, it's kind of all those things put together. It kind of um, refuses to be pinned down into any single. Yeah. Um, have you watched anything else recently that was you know, interesting? So I finished the Wheel of Time books. Mm -hmm. finished that huge epic and i have i have gone back and started to watch some more of the amazon series and it is um ripe for sure um but i have been watching my way through that i'm three or four episodes into that hmm. and so i'm it's not as unwatchable as i initially thought it was i think trying to watch it when i was on like book three mm -hmm. all just too fresh in my mind you know it adapts a lot it's 14 books so it moves through stuff it leaves a lot of stuff out it compresses things it assigns things to other character you know what i mean but mm -hmm. as an adaptation now that i've read all the books and i'm kind of looking back on it i'm like yeah i mean if you're gonna do this as a series these are pretty pretty smart choices it's it's been interesting you said you said something had something you saw that was weird you want to talk about it. oh so i watched i just randomly saw some a tweet or some, something on instagram or I, I don't know exactly where i saw it last night so i finished miracle mile and then i'm just on the couch and i i read this thing so adult swim did this thing for christmas called the adult swim yule log right so, uh, and this is a, if anybody would be interested in this, this is a, a spoiler because they basically set up kind of a joke. Um, so you watch it and the first two minutes is just a, you know, almost like a screensaver yeah. where it's just a, a, a Yule log, you know, it's just a fire in a fireplace for two minutes. And then you start getting some dialogue and it becomes a horror movie and it it's they do some really i don't want to spoil too much about it but but they do some really interesting kind of camera things because it starts out as kind of found footage and then it's these characters in an airbnb like this couple who the guy is going to propose to his girlfriend and his the way he makes money is he does youtube videos of just fires you know in, in a fireplace and so that's you know the conceit for why this camera is set up because you have you, you have several minutes of just this fire burning and just people talking and then you see this guy's head go in front of the camera and it's like the camera that he's set up you know for this youtube channel that he, he does and then it just goes from there and it was uh it's pretty neat it's it's 90 minutes which is too long for what it is. Um, if it had been like a half an hour, it would have been great. But have you ever seen too many cooks? I don't, I don't remember. It's so too many cooks was a, it, the, the same people that did this did too many cooks. And it's like a 12 or 15 minute long thing where it's like a, um, it's like an 80s sitcom and it's like the the opening credits of a 80s sitcom and they keep introducing these different characters and it it goes off to if you've not seen it I when you like come I, in over yeah. christmas we should watch it together cuz it is brilliant i mean it went like super viral about 10 years ago 8 10 years ago something like that I feel like i have and it just it gets like real dark, right? It gets real dark, yeah. Like people start getting killed, and there's a sci-fi part to it, and 
with like I, spaceships. I, I think I did see it, but I got to go back now and rewatch it. I don't remember. We should watch that together. I when remember you seeing it and thinking that is brilliant, but now I don't remember anything about it. So, so yeah, so this is the same people who did that. So it's the same kind of feel, although this is more serious. It's, it's mostly pretty serious. There's kind of some funny things to it, but so then the, so the couple are doing their thing and then a few more characters show up and the, the Airbnb has been double booked and it's these group of this, like these two couples and they come in and they agree that they're just going to stay in the place together. And the people that have shown up have just taken uh, edibles that are like just kicking in, like once they're introduced to the movie. And so then some really weird stuff happens with that. But uh, anyway, it, it was, there's some pretty clever stuff in it, but it was just too long. There's long stretches of just like, people just having conversations and it's well acted and well written, but you know, you're just, some of it, you're just like, okay, let's wrap this up and go to something, you know, more interesting, yeah. but, but it's a really neat, uh, you know, cause their whole goal with it is like, people are just gonna be like, Oh, I'm going to put on this Yule log thing and, you know, just have it playing in the background while I make Christmas cookies or whatever. And then it becomes this like full on horror film with a, you know, kind of like a Texas Chainsaw Massacre kind of killer and all this. So it was pretty neat. I mean, wasn't there? There's a serial killer in that too, right? There is. Yeah. Yeah. They're coming back to me now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Too Many Cooks is for people. I, I mean, it was so viral. I'm sure yeah. most people that would be listening to that's this shorter, have seen it. Right. That's just yeah. like a 15 minute film. Yeah. 12, 15 minutes, something like that. So, which is what this should have been. If, if it had been a short, it would have, but it's a full length and it, I mean, they had to have spent a pretty good amount of money on it because it, I mean, it, you know, it's well shot and good actors and all that, you know? Yeah. Um, but anyway, so that was, so I watched that and that was, it was, it was pretty neat, but uh, so. Very cool. Well, uh, we're recording on the night that uh, Avatar 2 opens, right? Is it tonight that it opens? Well, probably midnight. I mean, technically or maybe it's tomorrow. I don't know. Three Have you hours, read in minutes? <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. So but I'm definitely. I'll probably see it. I'm not excited to see it. That's the thing. I'm not excited, but just, you know, what I've seen. And I don't even care, like, if I would read spoilers, because it's not like I care that much about the story. But people are, you know, most of what I've seen is that it's just what the original one was in terms of this technological breakthrough that this one is doing that again. And it's, you know, so much better and it's just like unbelievable. You have to see it on a big screen and all that. So I will, I will definitely figure out a way to see it on a big screen with the glasses or whatever. I mean, yeah. You know, if you're yeah that's do it. That's, that's my plan as well. And I, I, we were talking about it via text where they're saying like, this might be like a $500 million opening weekend worldwide, you know, so it better be, he's been working on it for 10 years. That's the thing. I mean, he said, I mean, he has come out and said it has to make a lot of money just to break even, you, you know, know what's funny so. is people keep rolling their eyes at James Cameron. They're like, this guy with his good luck, pal. He delivers. I mean, however you feel about James Cameron, the guy keeps breaking his own record. And, and at this point, you know, Titanic, all oh, that's going to flop because I think it was the biggest movie ever, you know, the, the biggest budget ever. And then it was a gigantic hit, you know, the number one movie of all time when it came out. And then Avatar breaks it. And, you know, Avatar made so much money yeah. that you know, that record will get broken at some, but I think it was like 2.7 billion, you know, which is way beyond, you know, uh, most everything else. But so at this point to be, oh, he's done it twice to count him out a third time just doesn't make any sense to me. I mean, you just kind of have to assume this guy is like, whatever you think about his movies or him as a person, the guy is a genius, right. you know? I didn't, you know, Avatar, I saw that in the theater with the, in IMAX or something with the 3D glasses. And I, I saw it with Tom. Mm -hmm. And I remember, you know, I looked over at him a number of times and just like, wow, 
like the mm-hmm. experience of taking that movie in in 3D was was 3D in a way that I had never seen 3D before. Like the conceptualization of the shots took into account that third dimension. And it wasn't just like, ah, a pancake flies at you once in a while, right? Mm-hmm. 3D House of Pancakes. Um, and I liked it so much that I, I went back later and rented it or something on Apple TV, iTunes and watched it on my iMac. And it was not, I mean, I've Doesn't we, work viewed all, many worse movies, but it's not the same way of wow factor. You really yeah. need, it's, it's designed to be an immersive experience. Um, so yeah, I'm probably going to go see this one at some point. I'll wait I will too. Herbert dies down, but I'll see it on a big screen the way he sort of intends you to see it. And I'm sure it's going to be a roller coaster ride, but I doubt it'll change my life. And what's incredible to me about Avatar is it's, you know, the biggest movie of all time in terms of money. Everybody went to see it, basically. Obviously, people went to see it multiple times. And they were, I was reading an article today and they talked about how it didn't, it opened like $77 million, but it just, it would, you know, movies, most movies, I mean, it's always been like this, but now, you know, they have a great big opening and then they drop by like 60% or whatever. And it just had weekend after weekend where it would just barely drop. And it was the number one movie for eight weeks or something like that, you know, and just kept going on and on and on. But nobody quotes Avatar. Can you name the characters in Avatar? You know, you, you're not going to see. Well, I know they're called the Navi. There's a funny Saturday Night Live parody movie they made of it where the character is obsessed that the font in Avatar is papyrus. <laughs> yeah, the terrible font. Yeah, papyrus. Like he can't yeah. get. He's at work and he just can't get it out of his head. Like they spent how much money on this and the font they used in Avatar was papyrus. But you know, you had the at the. I remember at the time you had the people and people kind of laughed about it. But you had the people that wanted to live in Pandora, you know, and they were sad that they couldn't live in that. So there was that. But like. You know, you don't see kids don't dress up as these characters for Halloween. Nobody, right. you right. there aren't like Avatar t-shirts. Nobody has Avatar action figures, you know? So it's just weird that it's such a gigantic thing that nobody cares about. The merchandising is really, the fact that they it did so much money without most of that being merchandising is really surprising. Yeah. I mean, I think they made toys and things, but you know, but, but right. like I say, you don't see anybody walking around with avatar shirts or anything, you right. know? Well, we'll see. So. Chris and Chris talk movies at gmail.com. That is our handle. We're on the socials. Leave us a comment, like, and subscribe. Let us know what we ought to do next. Tell us what we missed in this movie in the comments. You know how it works. It's a digital age. All that stuff is good. And uh, tell all your friends and blah, blah, whatever. Um, What do you want to do for next time, my friend? So will next time be probably when you're in town? Or do you think? Yeah. I mean, we can do another one next week if you want. Or not. Oh, I was thinking we could do the, the one when we're together. It could just be sort of a bonus episode. Okay. Wherever it falls. Um, so but you... you wanna- you sent me the trailer for Cherry 2000, which is the same director. And if I'm, I've seen the trailer. I didn't actually watch the trailer when you sent it to me because I've seen the trailer before, but it's Melanie Griffith, right? Melanie I, and Griffith. I believe like a post post apocalyptic kind of a thing. Yeah. It just looks like bonkers gonzo. Terrible. Yeah. I mean, I, and that's one I've been, I'm, I mean, I, th- I think I can remember seeing the video box you know, in the store as a kid. So it's always been one that I was a little bit aware of, but again, one from the eighties that I've never actually watched. So I think the the broad synopsis of it is it's in the, it's in a future post-apocalypse. They have sex robots Mm -hmm. that you can write. And this guy has a sex robot, a model cherry 2000. That's his girlfriend that gets damaged or something so they pull the brain chip out but he's got a he's like don't worry about it you can this is on the trailer you can just put it in any other model and you get your girlfriend back but no this guy has to have the same she has to look and be the same so he needs the same model but they don't make cherry 2000s anymore well there's a warehouse in zone seven 
nobody goes in zone seven. So it's a, he finds Melanie Griffith, who's just crazy enough to go with him. And they go into the forbidden zone to try and find, save his robot girlfriend. I mean, it's It'd like be great if, if the opening is uh, this, this guy just had a theme with his films and like the opening is I was 30 years old and I finally met Cherry 2000. Exactly. <laughs> well, the trailer looks great because it's Melanie Griffith. Um, who shoots like shoulder mounted, uh, you know, RPGs. And there's, I think there's, I might be exaggerating a slightly, but I think there's over 7,000 shots of her shooting one of different shot. I mean, it's just, it's like half of the trailer is her shooting off an RPG in different, like, oh, well, that's her thing, I guess. She's just the RP. I don't know where she's carrying all these, you know, munitions, but. They're finding them. They're all over Zone 7, I guess. It looks a little bit, just from seeing that, I don't know how different it will be. It looks a little bit like Tank Girl. I don't know if you ever saw Tank Girl or not. Sure. but Yeah, look, it, it's sort of, you know, they shoot out in the desert and they're blowing stuff up. And there's mm -hmm. a, the it's not steampunk. That's a very specific thing. But sort of 80s punk, future apocalypse, you know. It's not as... Uh, Mad Max-ish. Doesn't take it. Doesn't look like it takes itself as seriously as like Mad Max or The mm -hmm. Road Warrior. Um, and there are look clearly parts of the world that haven't been destroyed. There's just these zones. I don't know. Okay, so let's do that. Yeah. And that's yeah. Like, I think that'd be fun. Fair. So join us next time for Cherry Two Thousand, which sounds like a porn, but I don't think it is. No, I don't think it is. Um, I I hope it's not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure. I mean, I don't, I don't know if Melody Griffith at this point, you know, was, I don't know about early on, but I don't think she was doing like adult films. So, so, um, cool. That's what we're doing. And, um, thank you for joining us. Uh, anything else to add before we sign off? I think that is all. Mm, that's all for me too. So uh, we will talk to you all next week.